after 6.30. And uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, uh, and we record these meetings for those of you who are new and haven't joined us yet for a parent forum, welcome. We record these meetings so that parents can watch the meetings if they can't make the time that we hold them. And um, really the, the um, frame for the meetings are pre is pretty loose. Um, usually I will start out with, oh, introducing myself. I'm Melissa Goff, I'm the superintendent uh, of the school district. This is my second year here and um, have been having a, a great time uh, getting to know the GAPS families and uh, our GAPS staff has been incredible. I can't imagine going through this actually with any other staff because our staff are so committed and working so hard um, and that they, some of them are even uh, here tonight too. Um, so uh, we will continue to have people coming in to the meeting we're letting folks in. So if they get stuck in the waiting room and you get a text from a friend that's in the waiting room, um, let us know in case we somehow haven't been paying attention and we will make sure to pop back in and let them in. Um, so a lot has happened. Wow, a lot has happened in, just in the last week. I think I'll just only go back as far as the last week, as far as um, catching you up or making sure we're all on the same page with information. But near the beginning of last week, last Tuesday, um, Colt Gill, who's the head of public instruction for the all the schools in the um, state, had a meeting with all of the superintendents. There are 197 of us and walked through the updated information related to COVID-19 in schools. And then just a few days later, we had um, the governor's press conference on Friday, uh, which was different than what uh, Colt had talked to us about just a few days before. So directly following the governor's press conference, he met with us again for about a half an hour to share with all of us who are superintendents um, what, what was gonna happen with the schools and how schools were not impacted for the most part, but could be impacted for some of the components of um, the governor's announcement. Uh, and then after that, on Monday, we received the executive order from the governor regarding the freeze and that language was, um, didn't have as much information in it as the press conference did, and, but was aligned with what the press conference had said. And then on Tuesday, we uh, heard from the Oregon um, School Athletics and Activities Association regarding impacts to athletics and activities and how those would be looking different as we move forward. So. I thought I would just show you just a couple slides to give you a high level overview so that we're all caught up together. And then we'll just ask, you guys can ask any questions and it doesn't have to be on what I'm sharing with you. So um, just be uh, aware that you, you don't have to limit your questions to what I am showing you. Um, So the first thing I want to show you guys are just some overviews that came from the very first, um, the first conversation that Colt had with us. And this is about our attempts to try and get students back in school. So our goal is to try and get our kids and our staff back together um, as quickly as possible. Yeah, you will know if you're an elementary parent that we're planning to do that that first week after the winter holiday, so that first week in January, and to start hybrid learning. And for middle and high school parents, we're looking at doing that in um, at the beginning of second semester, so about a month later. <clears throat> This is an update on the metrics and that those um, 
what I will say is part of the reason he was meeting with us was to review how we look at metrics differently than we were before. So the data that we look at now, we look at in different ways. And I just want to walk you through how, um, how that looks different for us now. So in the past, we used to look at three full weeks of data. Uh, so three seven day periods of data. And we needed to meet in Benton County because we our school district is in Benton County and in Lynn County because our school district is in Lynn County for each of those three weeks um, in order to open schools. Now, if, if any of these three weeks we weren't meeting the metrics, then we needed to add a, a third week so that we had three solid weeks in a row. So for example, if this first week we met, um, great. If the second week we met, great. If the third week we didn't meet, then the three weeks started over and we were on a new week, okay? The way that it has changed now is that we are looking at rather than a seven day period, rather than three seven day periods, we are looking at one 14 day period. And that helps us a bit because um, what that means for the data outcomes <clears throat> is that we could have a higher number in week one, which in the former model would have thrown us out of our ability to meet. But if we have a lower number in week two, that is so low that the total numbers over that 14 week period stay below, in, in the case of opening K-5, stay below 50 cases per 100,000, then we can open schools. So um, what it used to look like was um, 30, you, we had to be below 30 cases per week for three weeks in a row in order to open schools. So that was, fewer than 30 here, fewer than 30 here, and then fewer than 30 here. Now it's fewer than 50 to open K-5, but over the 14 day period. So we could have 32 cases in week one. And as long as we didn't have more than uh, 17 cases in week two, then we would, we would be on track to open schools. So it gives a little us a little bit of flexibility with the hills and valleys and, um, and that's a positive thing for our ability to reopen. Here is what the actual metrics table looks like. So we look at the county case rate because of the size of our county. Um, and uh, in order for us to begin on-site learning, and what we start with kindergarten through fifth grade is how we are, we are beginning, we can't start uh, with the older kids yet. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, we have to have fewer than 50 cases in that 14 day period. Once kids are in school, it's highly unlikely that we would end up needing to send them back home, meaning um, it's highly unlikely we would have to move from hybrid in-person learning to fully comprehensive distance learning again, because we have a great, another big cushion in the data itself. So to open, we have to have fewer than 50 cases but we can stay open up until we hit 200 cases per 100,000, which is really high. We haven't hit 200 cases per 100,000 yet. We are, we were above, we are at 161 cases per 100,000 for each of the counties um, this last 14 day period. So that's uh, too high. Um, it's, over three times as high as we need it to be in order for us to, to open for K-5. We have to be in this yellow zone to um, open, okay? Uh, Melissa, just to clarify, so it's, it's up to 100. Did I say, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm used to on the other table saying 50 and 50 per week, but yeah, it's under 100 total. So not only did they, in, thank you, Andrew, not only did they, um, adapt the length of time, which gives us more cushion, they also allowed us higher numbers. So over that 14 day period in the past, it would have been a total of 60 cases, uh, 30 and 30 uh, each of the two weeks, but now they've raised that to 100, okay? 
sorry, I'm going to skip through things that aren't necessarily um, either accurate anymore or um, related to parents. But uh, one thing that has changed that you may not have heard um, is the Oregon Health Association's definition of an exposure, which now is defined as an individual who has close contact, which means they're closer than six feet for longer than 15 minutes throughout 24 hours throughout a, a total day with a person who has a COVID-19 case. What that means for your students is that if an adult um, at the school, once they go into school in person, if an adult at the school uh, tests positive for COVID and they have worked um, closely with your student, not necessarily for 15 minutes in a row, but for a total of 15 minutes over the course of the day that they saw them, then um, that would be considered um, a, what we consider a close exposure. Um, again, OHA also updated on face coverings, talking about uh, the value of face coverings and that um, they, the expectation now for our students is not only that they're worn indoors, but they are also worn outdoors. So that is a big change from the guidance that we had had before. Uh, some folks have asked about the use of a face shield for their child, and that can only be done on a very limited basis. And that would be um, in special circumstances where you've met with the principal and there are medical reasons for why um, a face shield alone would be required um, because we know that the virus spreads in the air. And these pieces I have talked with you about. So, oh, students can remove their masks for individual supervised mask breaks, but what classes can't do is they can't say, okay, everyone's gonna have a five minute mask break and let everyone take off their masks. So just to reassure you, that's not what would be happening within the classrooms. Okay. And then, There we go. Um, and I know this isn't as large as we would like to have it, but I'm having a hard time downloading it. These are the announcements with the governor's pause with her freeze. Um, she continues to talk about the import of, um, of opening. This is so teeny tiny. I even need my glasses on my screen to read it. So uh, she's encouraged all businesses to mandate work from home to the greatest extent possible. So you may have heard that our teachers are again working from home, and that is true, unless they work in a classroom setting where they just cannot do their job, um, or if they are working in limited in-person instruction, so some of your children may be in limited in-person learning, then they're allowed to go to school. And um, and we recleaned all of the limited in-person classrooms on Tuesday, just as an extra precaution, not because we had any concerns specifically about that um, at the time. A lot of these uh, pieces are related to, um, to businesses rather than to us. Um, one of the things that you should know is that we are working with um, we are working both with Oregon Health Authority and then we're also working with our other um, public and um, public school districts and universities around potential testing and some steps that we might be able to take around uh, contact tracing and similar activities. So that is still in development, but I can tell you that we um, we met with a number of our neighboring districts and the LBCC president and the Oregon State University president last week where we brought up is this, it, could it be possible for some partnership around that? And our hope is that we'd be able to partner. You may notice that on, I may have noted that um, starting, well, in November and in December on Mondays, there is going to be free testing in Lynn County. And I believe that's at the fairgrounds. Andrew, make, make sure I'm correct on that. And then in December, it will also be on Fridays. And if you are interested in pursuing that, you can do so by, um, by signing up online. And we'll make sure that information is in the, um, is in the next set of information that we share out with you from as a district. 
Okay. Um, there are two big things with the governor's information that I wanted to also talk with you about. And uh, those are the quarantining piece um, and the, um, oh, and I already talked to you about the staying at home, working at home. So um, my, uh, my role is not to, to police who's going on vacations or who's having people at their house. That's not what we are, what we do. Um, thank you, Andrew, for posting the testing information. Um, but uh, we are within gaps um, going to have folks who have traveled out of the state to quarantine at home if you're a staff person or if you are a student um, for those 14 days. Now that impacts very few students right now unless they're in athletics or activities um, and, um, and impacts very few staff members because so many are right now working from home. Um, but it is definitely a hard, uh, a difficult situation for us to be in. And what I can tell you is my driver for any of the decisions that I make, and, and I'll tell you that Colt Gale last Friday told us that we must do that. On, by Monday, he was saying, uh, using the same language as the governor, which is you should do that. Um, my whole drive is I just need, I want your kids back in school so badly. I just, I, I, uh, I know how hard it is on them. And I know how hard it is on you. And so uh, anything that we can do to support health, um, regardless of choices that folks make, um, is what we're going to do. And so we know if folks have been exposed by um, through some travel plans that they may have, we just want to make sure that you're safe, you pay attention to the quarantine piece that when we bring you back around kids or around each other, um, folks are safe. So those are the decisions we oh the osaa decision um i don't have a powerpoint slide for that but um basically it impacted any indoor athletics and activities that that those are shut down right now as well and so there is um training uh that can happen outside for those activities but uh right now we uh our understanding from osaa or what what the rules are for OSA is that indoor events are not happening. We don't know how long that will last. Everything has that two week window right now, but it's all dependent on the data for the state. And as soon as we know, we will let you know. All right, that is all the prologue that I have for you tonight. So um, I'm sure I have missed things that are important to you or um, may have talked about some things that also are important that you'd like to discuss. So please, um, you can ask questions in the chat is usually the easiest um, to do, but oh, we don't have too many people here. And so if you want to unmute and just ask questions, that works great too. I have a question. I don't know if you answered it already because I hopped on a little bit late. What was the reasoning on bringing the K through five back first versus like seniors or oh, the high school students? That's a great question. We actually have, we cannot bring um, the older students back uh, first. So K-5 has to come back and then there are even stricter. I think that's where 50 is. Andrew, is that where the 50 limit is? The, um, to have all students back or any secondary students that are older than sixth grade, and the sixth graders have to be attached to an elementary school, not, not part of a middle school. Um, you have to have fewer than 50 over those 14 days. So the K-5, the younger kids, uh, data is showing that those kids are less susceptible to COVID and uh, do not see the same impact to their bodies. And so the state made that decision with K-5. Yeah, it's essentially it's twice as hard to bring back six to 12 students as it is K-5 based on those numbers, the 100 and the 50. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Sorry, I had not addressed that. You mentioned at the board meeting that you're hoping to create a plan where kids are less likely to have to change teachers if kids go back to in-person. For the kids who will remain online, is this also a possibility? Trying to prepare my kids for potential change. Thanks, Jill. Um, actually, it is the plan, and Jill's talking about the K-5 plan. We shared 
um, some highlights of that with the school board. And uh, you as parents, if you're a, a parent of a K-5 student, will be getting more information on that tomorrow, um, including information to be able to uh, select which model you'd like your student to be attending school in after the first of the year. Uh, one of the factors that we've been really struggling with with bringing kids back in the hybrid model is we had a very difficult time figuring out how we could do it and without really disrupting the student and teacher relationship because we thought we were gonna, going to need to reassign a bunch of kids to different teachers based on how many kids take distance learning. We The schedule that has been, uh, that has evolved Actually, we think almost all of our students are gonna stay with their classroom teacher. It doesn't matter if they're hybrid or they're distance learning. So it will be very few students who need to change. Um, students and staff will find out who their teachers are before they leave for the winter break. So you'll have some time to, to prepare for that if, if your student is one of the few who needs to change teachers. How will state testing go if we don't opt out? Will it be done at home or will the students have to go to a testing site? We are choosing virtual all year. Thanks, Chelsea. Good question. I um, So my own commentary, that is my opinion, uh, my informed <laughs> opinion, I can't imagine we're doing state testing this year. Um, we would not be able to um, do it in a secure testing environment if if kids are in virtual. And so um, it's it's not looking very likely that state testing will occur. So when you ask, would kids need to go to a testing site? Um, we would need to arrange for how our virtual students would come in, yes, in person into the schools in order to test. We would follow all of the protocols around testing. So kids would not be in a computer lab that has kids sitting next to each other, it would be a very different setting than what you've seen before. And uh, we do know that the Chromebooks are compatible with the state testing equipment. So kids should be able to be in large, um, highly ventilated areas like cafeterias and spaced out in order to take those tests. But again, um, I am, I am, I have not heard anyone from the Department of Education talk about um, planning for state testing. Good, thanks, Jill. HD, why no fall conferences? Regardless of what this year looks like for learning, parents still need feedback about student progress. That's a great question and we agree. Um, we, When we were planning for the beginning of the year, we really uh, were not aware uh, the impact that shifting some of the days on the calendar was going to have with our inability to check in with parents. At the beginning of the year, when we first, hmm, we changed the, the student day calendar this year in August. Originally, kids were to start back a week before we actually ended up having them start back. And um, we, we took those days um, in order for teachers to be able to engage in professional development and to set up the, in these new technologies. But we had to find those days somewhere else in the calendar. And so working with the union leadership, we went through and identified days that could be moved to the front of the calendar base, exchanged for those front of the calendar days. The, the um, conferences is one of those days. Grading, um, some of the um, time that's always at the end of a grading period was also part of that. Um, at that time, we believed that there would be plenty of time for, I don't know what we thought, but there would be plenty of time for conferences to kind of naturally embed into some of the other time that on Wednesdays, we were not, we underestimated the amount of learning that staff were going to need to do um, in engaging in this, this way of learning and the amount of time that was gonna take in order to assess student work um, that staff need to use on Wednesdays. And so we lost what your feeling is that we lost those conferences and we feel that same way we did. We've talked uh, about it actually in our staff meetings, um, staff forums this week 
with elementary, middle, and high school and how we can ensure that that does not happen in the future quarters. So in December, I'm bringing a proposed calendar change to the school board so that we can have those, ensure that those days stay sacrosanct so that you are able to connect with your child's teacher. I heard on the news that they found many kids in the Salem area were failing. I know one of my children didn't fare as well this nine weeks as in the past. Overall, what is your impression of how kids are doing in our district? Um, thanks, Carol. I appreciate you asking. And I would say um, our kids are our kids overall are faring well, and we have more kids struggling than we've had in the past. This is a whole new way of, of learning for our kids and kids are in very different environments um, and teachers are learning as well. And sometimes that, that whole combination makes it even more challenging. Um, one of the things that we have done that is a little bit different than what I read, now I haven't spoken to the superintendent of Salem specifically about this, but so I just read the article as you did. Um, one thing that we have done is we have marked students as incomplete in middle and high school so that they have through the semester to get caught up if they if they were not faring well in their classes. And um, so for those missing assignments or those assignments that kids uh, did extremely poorly on for kids who, who struggled a lot um, and, uh, and earned an incomplete in the class, they have until the end of the semester to do that work. Um, that's hard. That's it's hard on the student and it's hard on the staff member. And we uh, again during the forums this week talked a lot about um, who are those students, not individually, but what are some of the patterns that we're seeing among students that we could be uh, working with differently in order to to proactively address some of the dis uh, disengagement or lack of success. One of the challenges for us has been uh, we really struggled for the first few months of the year around knowing whether students are on the other end of the computer. Uh, students camera, a lot of student cameras are off depending on uh, who the student is. And um, part of what we've worked on with staff is when is it okay to say we need you to have your camera on so that we can see the work that that you've done and what are other ways that you can engage with students if they have their camera off to ensure that you know that they've done the work and that you're seeing they're engaging with you and one of those really simple features the middle one of the middle school teachers was talking about I guess was high school teacher was talking about yesterday in their forum about how uh, beneficial the chat has become and they hadn't realized um, that there had been no way for students who felt uncomfortable verbalizing in front of their peers to communicate with the teacher prior to distance learning. It's actually a benefit that they've found. And so now they're using that chat feature as a way for kids to engage in conversation who typically had not in, in their past relationship with the student had not seen those students engage. So what we're trying to do is capitalize on those learnings and apply them for this second quarter, this next part of, of the school year so that we can um, better support kids. I want nothing more, this is Christy, I'm sorry. Uh, I want nothing more than for my son to return to school. However, every time there is a change to his routine, there is an adjustment period that has behaviors. How would that be handled in this back to school situation? Um, so Christy, we would be, one of the advantages of going back to school in this model uh, that I didn't talk about at the beginning and that you may not know is that the, the limits on how many people can be in a room are pretty strict, extremely strict. So um, the square footage that is needed uh, for a class to be held is simply, we don't have any classrooms big enough for a regular size class to be held because uh, we would need way too much square footage. So what we are, what you'll see when kids go back is they'll have about half as many students as typical in the classroom. Um, 
And that in and of itself will help us help your child, better help your child with the transition and some of the behaviors that will happen during that. I mean, hopefully if your child is new, right? If, it, if they're a, a little one who hasn't been in the school district before, or if you've just moved here, then we may not know your child's tendencies. And in that case, I would reach out to the teacher and let them know. But um, if if we've had your child and and have kind of a history of, things that might trigger your child's behaviors to shift, we'll be paying attention to that as we transition. And uh, we anticipate that that will be a lot, a lot more helpful. Dell asks, is the chat feature you mentioned available to fifth grade students? And um, so I, I am not in their classroom. Gretchen, you might know about the chat feature being available to fifth grade students. I think she might be chatting. The I'm oh, there you. getting to my microphone. Is my sound okay? Mm -hmm. um, so the having the chat on or having the chat off is up to each individual teacher, but it is an option for them to allow. And I have seen some pretty amazing things show up in the chat from kids that, like Melissa said, I never knew that they would have said that or thought that. So it has provided um, an avenue that we didn't know we needed for some kids. Um, and then also, especially for fifth, fourth, third, second grade kids, it's so fun to watch their spelling when they're texting and that they're using writing to communicate in a way, again, that they haven't had to before. But it is up to that individual teacher and I have some teachers that will turn it on during sometimes during the day and then they'll turn it off during other times when chat does not need to happen. Chat can also be set up to be sent just to the direct teacher so that kids aren't doing side chats on their own um, like you know talking about the Pokemon game they want to play or something so it um, teachers have a lot of control over how they open that up. Thanks. So there are a couple questions about how will, okay, so how will students keep their same teacher if only half the children will be in the classroom upon return? Great question. I didn't explain that to you. So um, thank you. How this will work in the elementary schedule. Now the middle and high school schedules are still being worked on for second semester. So I don't have the answer for you there. Plus middle and high schools by their nature change teachers because that's the way their schedules work. So um, I'm really talking about K-5, K kindergarten through fifth grade right now. But, um, but the schedule is an AM PM schedule. So students will have, um, and this is the same, this is a very similar schedule to what we had initially um, built for, um, K-2 students um, that we thought were going to be able to start in a hybrid model in August. So half of the class will be there in the morning, half of the class will be there in the in the afternoon, um, and they will meet four days a week in that model. Uh, next question from Sharon. Can you please explain how the hybrid day will look with half the class in person and the other half learning? Oh, from home, I assume they all have the same teacher. So, um, and that that is what is interesting too. So let's, it. this is where numbers come in. We are really needing you all to fill out the selection form that you'll get tomorrow because it is important for us in our planning regarding uh, student and teacher classroom assignments, but the, uh, the intent is that staff will have um, the kids that they are working with in person. They won't be, they won't be live streaming with, while they're with kids in person, that won't be happening. Um, and then, and while they're with that half of the group, the other half of the group will be at home in asynchronous learning, similar to what you what you have now and are familiar with now. Then that will flip for the afternoon. So um, it's not recorded and presented on Zoom. Uh, Dell asks if the chat is only seen by the teacher. It depends on the teacher settings, Dell. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Someone else answered it. I didn't need to do that. This is good. You guys can answer each other. Thank you. 
HD, YouTube is a huge distraction for young students. Can the district block access for student accounts since teachers can screen share any videos that they want their students to view? I tried to block on the Chromebook, but the district <laughs> blocked the blocker. Yeah, that isn't that ironic? Um, so here's what I would ask you to do. Because we do use YouTube as a learning tool so that students can access whether the teacher is facilitating the class or not. So there are some YouTube assignments that students are doing during their asynchronous time completely independent of their teacher. Um, if you are having concerns about YouTube, and we have heard this from more than one, um, more than one parent, if you, uh, and you, you might need some help learning how to do this, but your, you can control on your internet settings, you can control that access. And that's really the place to do that is through your own home internet where you have um, a login for your, for your children that's different than the login for yourself. If elementary schools, uh, and Christy agrees with you, HD. <laughs> if elementary schools go to hybrid, will the virtual only students still have the same resources available to them? Library pickup, lunches, et cetera. Yeah, they still will have all those resources available. So um, they'll still have their specials in, in the same way. So they'll still have, it, it will feel very much like what they have now. Now, um, the time that they're synchronous with their teacher may be different. The time of day, it may be in the afternoon rather than in the morning, but yeah, the, um, the schedule will work very similarly. Would it be healthier to have cohorts of children in a classroom each day, Monday, uh, Thursday, and Tuesday, Friday, instead of blending groups in the same environment each day? So cohorts. So we are working with cohorts. Um, so I may not be, um, speaking clearly. So it's the same cohort of students. Um, oh, I, oh, you're talking about the shared environment. Never mind, catching up with you. So um, in the morning, same, same cohort of kids is going to school every day, at, but it is a different group of kids in the afternoon going to school in that same classroom. We actually have cleaning protocols in place uh, for in between the AM and the PM sessions. So um, there are entire protocols and um, PPE that are provided to uh, staff. Different staff have different roles in the cleaning and the uh, sanitizing in between the AMPN schedules. But because we know that, um, that uh, little kids uh, do better in learning how to read and learning how to problem solve. If they're in conversations about those things with their teachers every day, we, um, we looked at the schedule that you're talking about, which is a two day a week schedule and um, decided against it. Okay, that was Becca. So more questions. Here we go. No. Thank you. That does sound good. Okay. Do the protocols include HVAC improvements? They do. And so there is, um, I think it's a MERV 13 setting is the, the number. And again, Andrew, who listens in on all these calls might know that off the top of his head. But um, there's a certain MERV level that is recommended for, for COVID. And that is the level that we have um, uh, used as our protocol. Uh, there are a few exceptions in, um, I think, uh, and I may misspeak, so forgive me, but I think maybe Central Elementary has an older system that is more difficult. And so, um, so additional, uh, additional protocols are being put in place in any of the sites that have those limitations. Oh, Andrew, good job. Oh, and it was MERV 13, yes, okay. With an AM PM schedule, if a family has two children, can they both be in person during the same half of the day? Yeah, Sharon, so that also has been a, a value that we've held, right? And I think we talked about that last last summer when we thought we were all gonna be able to get kids back in school. Um, what I ask you to do, so when you fill out your selection form, um, I, if, as long as the kids are on the same model, it'll work. So if you have both kids in hybrid, then they'll 
both go during the same part of the day. If you have one student in hybrid, of course, and one student in distance learning, it won't work for you, but yeah. Excellent. Thank you for the very significant amount of work and the good job that has been done. Oh, you're welcome, Becca. And really, I, I just get the opportunity to talk to you guys. We have a team of people. You have a team of people who work for the school district who have done an incredible amount of work um, at every single level. I'm so proud of them. One of the one of the stories I'll share. Yeah, you're welcome, uh, Sharon. One of the stories that has been really compelling is from South Shore. I don't know if you have a student at South Shore. Can you raise your hand? Oh, right. I forgot. Um, uh, so at South Shore Elementary School, education assistants uh, came up with an idea of holding a, um, a virtual recess, basically, on Wednesdays for students um, to come in and just have unstructured time with their peers that is supervised. And it's re very highly orchestrated. So students come in, um, they don't have to go, but it's, it's fun. And um, they uh, jump into the main Zoom chat like we're doing. And then they tell the, the hall monitor, who is the person who is Andrew in this situation, right? The hall monitor, um, which room they wanna go into. So this week it was, there was a Lego room and there was a room where kids were drawing acorns. And then there was a room where kids were drawing how to, how to learning how to draw this really leafy fall tree that one of our um, education assistants who's a really gifted artist was drawing. And then there were other rooms too available. I just can't remember what they all were. Um, and so students just said where they wanted to go. And, I happened to get to go to this event on Wednesday and it was so darling because they're kindergartner and first graders and some are her logging in and speaking in English and some are logging in and speaking in Spanish saying where they want to go. And so they go into these rooms and they're just doing the work on their own, um, but showing each other and having casual conversations with the education assistant or assistants who are in the room talking with them. That education assistant shared that I think about four weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, in a staff meet, a district-wide classified staff meeting where we had all the education assistants in a room together, shared what they were doing. And a whole bunch of other EAs said, oh my gosh, I wanna start that at our school. We could do that at our school. And so that's the type of stepping up, thinking differently, making really important things happen for our kids around their mental health and their social relationships that um, have been essential. I'm just, I'm super proud of the work that they've been doing. No question, just wanted to say you've done an amazing job through all this. I've joined in on many of the board meetings and forums and you and the board are amazing. Ah, geez, Renee, thank you. That's really, really nice. HD, parents were told that students would only need to learn how to navigate Canvas, but we have teachers using several different sites and apps for assignments. Okay, many are glitchy, slow, or even blocked by the district, but are required for assignments. Hmm. This really puts students at an unfair disadvantage when they only have access to district Chromebooks or limited access to other devices. I agree, HD, for sure. So um, two things need to happen. One, I need you to communicate that to, uh, to your, your child's teacher. Um, we certainly are not wanting that to happen. And that's why we make sure that, that we share with staff that apps that we have available or what, what um, programs that Chromebooks will work on. Uh, we wanna make sure that um, we, don't, we haven't created a disadvantage among some of our students because some may have access to a um, desktop and some may not. Um, but also we wanna make sure that nothing's glitchy and works well with the tools that we've given to the kids. So. Uh, if you've talked to the teacher already and that wasn't successful for you, at that point, then then you just have a conversation with the school principal to make sure that they understand what what your worries are. And um, I, I think a conversation with the teacher will likely address that. Um, and uh, that's really important because I think sometimes teachers see something new and they're really excited about it and know that it it as a tool, if it worked perfectly, it would be great for kids and may not act, they may not actually realize that the kids uh, um, will have some struggles with, with operating it. Chelsea, can more elementary schools have that Wednesday recess program or is it up to the individual school to implement? So Chelsea, individual schools are doing things differently. So uh, your school may be doing something similar, but but different. I can tell you that um, I serve on the Albany Public Schools Foundation board while I sit there. Um, I don't really 
have voting power, but I get to see the work that they're doing. And when we met on Wednesday, they were approving their classroom grants for this year. And ideas similar to that Wednesday program are part of what many of the elementary schools were asking the foundation for funding to help um, to help get off the ground. And some of the funding has is um, is interesting in what they're looking at, right? Are there are there blocks that we can send home with kids? But uh, the South Shore program, I, so I said, wow, those, blo those blocks are great. And um, they just have the kids pull out their math manipulatives because there are blocks within their math manipulatives. So, um, you know, some kids were, were not playing with Legos or blocks at all, they, but they were connecting things. So that was the theme. So they would go get puzzles out of their out of their cupboards and bring the puzzle and talk about how they were connecting things. So that was pretty cool. What will the AM PM hours be? Mm, I knew someone would ask that. Cindy, I don't know. Um, I don't know for your school. Um, partly, I don't know for your school because this is a transportation um, masterpiece. Uh, Russ Buttram and Cindy Moran, who head up our transportation department, have worked extremely hard to figure out how we are able to get two full sets of buses to, to school and home and then back to school and home uh, twice a day. And so you are gonna see start times be different depending on which school your child attends. So um, I, I can't give you that moment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for understanding, <laughs> I appreciate that. My younger son loves the social hour on Wednesdays. It's the only day he looks forward to logging in for school. Well, that's a bummer. Um, I loved the first line. The second line is a bummer. I wish it could be incorporated every day as an incentive. That's really awesome feedback, HD. And I would encourage you to talk to um, talk to the principal of is that at Marcy's school or at South Shore. Um, so if you're not at South Shore, uh, whoever the principal is and um, talk to them and let them know that because I do know that schools, oh yeah, okay, great. Um, schools are looking at ways that they can fine tune and tweak things that they're doing in order to create a little more space. It is difficult because Wednesdays is a day where education assistants don't have direct contact with instruction, which is different than Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday. They're actually facilitating groups during a lot of the time that is less structured. They have small groups of kids that they're bringing together. So Wednesday is the time that they are able to have that flexibility. But I'm really glad that your son likes it. My heart goes out to high school kids who are missing those fun spirit uh, school spirit activities, pep rallies, spirit week, homecoming. If we ever get back to being in person, I hope there's some creative thinking to create that fun school spirit. Carol, mind us too. I mean, I, I remember those times um, in high school and how much fun they were. And I was the crazy hair day person. I was, um, you know, I love, I loved those dress up days. I do know that at South Albany high school, they did have a spirit week this, this year where they had, um, different spirit days that the kids dressed up uh, differently. And I know this because Mr. Hunter, who's the new principal there, who used to be the principal at Albany Options School, told a story yesterday about um, on pajama day, he decided, well, he would wear his long johns to work. But remember, uh, Mr. Hunter hasn't really seen many of the teachers in person, and um, this was still when teachers were teaching within their classrooms in the building, but he didn't run into them very often. They weren't, you know, because everyone's being really careful, um, and he came out of it. He forgot he was wearing his long johns. He came out of his office and had this long conversation with these two teachers who were looking at him like he was crazy the whole time, and he could not figure out why their eyes were so wide, and they were, um, until he went back into his office and caught himself in the mirror and realized that um, he had not prepared his staff to see him also participate in school <laughs> spirit, so <laughs> he had a good laugh about that. But yeah, there's going to need to be a lot of a lot of uh, events, and those events will look different. And I think the creativity of our kids is probably going to come uh, into play there quite a bit. Our kids have been um, incredible sources of inspiration for me in how they are engaging 
with this pandemic and then figuring out different ways that they could do the same things that they've done before. We have a high school group at West right now, um, their leadership group, who has historically done a lot of holiday giving, organized a bunch of um, kind of, they would fall under the school spirit activities, right? The kids all engage in together in order to fundraise or, or bring food in. Um, but since they're not in person, this, they, can't, they can't do things the same way. So um, uh, Eric Eide, their, their teacher reached out to me today and said, hey, I know we've got restrictions and I'm not sure what the kids will be able to do, but they would like to, to propose some ideas and, um, and they'd like to do that the first week back in December. So I get to meet with the students and they get to give me their proposals for how they would um, give to those who need right now. Um, but using uh, a more technological approach than how they've done it in the past. And I know they're going to come up with a solution that, you know, probably none of us who get to work with them every day would have the ingenuity to come up with. So we're, we're getting close to the end of our evening. It's almost almost 7 30 so if you have something that's burning that you've been waiting and holding on to now is a great time to stick it in the chat or just ask so that we make sure and get that answered tonight if you ever are in these forums or if you are someone who watches board meetings you um, you know that my cat seldom lets me get through a meeting without her jumping up on the keyboard. And so she's at my feet right now, kind of purring, asking to get up. We'll see if she makes the leap. Oh, there she is in there. All right. On the threat of school spirit and unity, can we please bring back the Pledge of Allegiance in all of our schools again? I'm not sure when this stopped being the norm, but we do it every day in our home now and have a little history lesson along with it. I think it would really help the kids feel a connection to one another and their schools. Thanks, HD. Yeah, so Oregon law changed. It's once a week for the Pledge of Allegiance, and um, schools should still could, should still be doing it. That's really neat that you use that opportunity as a history lesson with your family and with your kids. I think that's that's fantastic. All right. Well, I want to say thank you. Thanks you guys so much for joining. I appreciate your time. And um, I appreciate the questions. Those are all really great. And please share, share information with your friends who weren't able to make it tonight. We will have this recording available to you though. So, um, so they can watch that if they would prefer the longer version. <laughs> have a great night. Be safe and happy Thanksgiving. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, guys.